Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about assortment and the shelf. Before I get into anything else, I just want to make sure that everybody is prepared for a great webinar experience. So um, just going to give you a few tips on using GoToTraining. So obviously select your audio by clicking on either telephone or mic and speakers under your audio. Most people have the uh, ability to listen very easily through mic and speakers, but if you are having audio issues, you might want to look at uh, dialing in on the telephone instead. If your screen is grainy, then you may want to go into your control display settings on your computer and change the resolution down to a lower resolution. Um, you can also so use that orange arrow that is beside the go-to training box to minimize and maximize the control panel because that whole control panel is quite big so you can make it smaller just by clicking on the orange arrow. In terms of communications we do mute everybody for the um, webinars and it's not because I don't uh, like getting your perspective and feedback it's because we tend to usually have one or two people that end up forgetting to mute themselves and then we end up having all kinds of background noise so uh, based on that, we mute everybody, but we do have our chat box. So if you want to send me messages or notes or ask questions, you can feel free to do that. I try to be the queen of multitaskers, um, and we'll try to address some of your questions. Um, we also have our CMKG team on the other side to answer any questions that you have, including if you have any um, issues with your technical. Uh, we can try to help you with that as well by having you type into the chat box. So that's about it for what you need to know about uh, uh, GoTo training. Um, the other thing I wanted to note is that you can get the notes for the training session by going to Into Materials and it's right up at the top. You'll see the CMKG assortment and shelving webinar notes PDF file. Um, you'll also note that there's a lot of other links to um, things with CMKG including setting up consultation sessions, accessing a trial membership, those kind of things. So please make sure that you uh, check out all of the great uh, information that we have in there. So for those of you who, who um, are not familiar with Category Management Knowledge Group, just a little bit of information about us before we get into the webinar. We're a training company, but we're a category management organization first. So I've put our mission statement up here for you to look at because I think it really articulates well who we are as an organization. Um, in that, we focus on delivering value-added learning experiences that drive knowledge, skill, and expertise, and competitive advantage to each of you as individuals and also to our key stakeholders and our clients. Um, we're all our, our huge passion is for category management and always looking at learning more and that really resonates in everything that we do. And one of the things that we also do is run a lot of um, free live webinars to share our learning set with the industry. Uh, I'm Sue Nichol, the, the voice in the background here, and uh, I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session. I am the president and owner of CMKG. And uh, I absolutely loved running training sessions live, facilitating in webinars, doing conferences. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. So it's my pleasure to be here with you guys today. So just to give you a little bit of background about CMKG, so you kind of know where we're coming from, um, we do have quite a uh, um, long history and a lot of experience as it relates to category management. Um, we have a lot of experience in our team um, with Catman practitioners from Procter & Gamble and Nestle. I personally was working for Procter & Gamble for almost 20 years and I led their Canadian category management team and also was um, a major team member on their global board. Um, started the category management knowledge group in 2004, so we're over 10 years old now. Um, we were the first company in the world to actually offer online category management training. And when I first came back to my team and said, we're going to create category management training online, they thought I had lost my mind. Um, then in 2010, we were the first training company in the world to be certified by the Category Management Association. We also developed our own retailer curriculum that tied in with cert certification that we rolled out in 2011. We also added in case studies. So we've really realized that a blended learning solution, our training is all the basis of it is online, but um, we, we really believe strongly in a blended learning pro program. And one of the great components of a blended learning program is case studies, which many of our students and clients um, take advantage of. 
In 2013, we started focusing on the value equation. Um, it's not just about checking off boxes and making sure that you um, finish the training courses that are required. You need to start embracing um, learning and thinking of it as an ongoing um, uh, benefit to both you uh, as an individual as well as your team and organization and so we really developed a great value equation for clients if you're ever if you're interested in uh, learning more about that um, and we've also developed best practices so we've gone from uh, we do have CAN programs that you can buy and it's very simple but we also for corporate clients we like to work with them to really understand what their needs are before we even try to put together um, a plan for them and then we tailor a program for their both their short and long-term needs to really make sure that uh, we're, we're meeting exactly what it is that they require for their team or organization. So that's it. I'll, I'll give you more information about CMKG at the end um, because this is not a promotional thing about um, about CMKG necessarily. Um, but uh, I was at the um, CMA Category Management Association conference last week and there are these certifying bodies for uh, category management um, for North America. And um, I also have been sitting on their collaboration steering committee. If you haven't heard, they're actually releasing in November an excellent white paper on collaboration and it has been a team of about 25 people who have been working on this across um, a lot of different retailers, manufacturers, and um, like I said, I also had the pleasure of working on this team. It's one of the um, greatest projects I've worked on with some very high-level people. Um, one of the things that we ended up developing um, as the white paper was being developed was a collaboration model. So this is CMKG's um, collaboration model that basically Collaboration is the buzzword, if you haven't heard, um, for 2014 and definitely going into 2015. Um, but it's really important to understand that there's different levels of collaboration, and it's really based on the data and tools in your organization, the research available, the personnel, and how trained and experienced and how much access there is to multifunctional teams. And that really affects the output as well. So. Um, at the level one, you have less data, less access to research, um, and less resources, and um, not necessarily going in as a multifunctional team. That's going to result in some collaboration. It doesn't mean you're not collaborating, but it's more of a tactical and transactional solution than you get into level two, where there's more data, research, and personnel. And then level three is really that high-level collaboration that a lot of companies are trying to attain, and they're really struggling to do that. So um, we actually ran some live sessions at our conference at the conference last week and they were all about activating collaboration. And I had a lot of great discussions both with some retailers and with quite a few suppliers who are really struggling at the strategic level across their, their tactics. And so basically um, what I've decided to frame this uh, this webinar today around, I'm going to be talking specifically about assortment and shelving, but really talking about it also from a strategic level, because a lot of organizations are starting to realize, wow, the reason that we're struggling with the, um, the whole approach to collaboration and then the ultimate level of really strategic joint business planning between reseller and manufacturer is because we haven't clearly identified our overall corporate goals and strategies in individually and then it makes it very difficult to do the rest of the joint business planning um, approach uh, which ends up being very much sharing those corporate strategies and goals and trying to find mutual opportunities that you, you can then work on to develop your business. So um, that's why at the highest level of identifying the corporate strategies and goals, I want to start there um, talking about that when we start going through assortment and shelving and then I'm going to walk you through a process of um, how you can potentially become more strategic in your assortment and shelving approach. So we're really going to be focusing on that top level stuff because we tend to jump in and start doing analysis, um, both assortment and shelving projects. Some of them are together, some are separate, but a lot of the time there's not an overarching strategy either for the retailer and or for the manufacturer. So. Um, Let's start out by looking at the uh, four-step category management process, just to kind of remind you of where the tactics fit into this whole piece. So we have the retailer strategy, which really defines the rules and principles for the way their stores operate. Then the second 
step of the um, category management model is developing the category plans. And this is where the analysis completed and a category plan is developed. This is where suppliers work very closely with retailers um, within specific categories. And sometimes this is the only level that they're actually um, working um, their tactics. So they're doing assortment and shelving, but it's all related to um, the retailer, but they don't have those overarching strategies of corporately within their organization, what are they trying to accomplish, what are the processes, the principles and guidelines for both assortment and for shelving. Then step three is implementing the category plans and getting them executed at store level, and then finally is reviewing category performance. So really, um, like, I, like I said, and I'm going to probably be reiterating it all through this webinar, is the fact that so many retailers and suppliers jump into the tactics and do all the analytics, and they have these fancy software packages and tons of data, and they're making shelving and assortment decisions, but it's very tactical-based, and there's not, not that strategic component to it. So um, there's a lot more strategy that can be tied in that really focuses in on a lot on the consumer. The consumer tends to be um, left out in a lot of the um, analytics that are happening. So um, the, I'm going to walk you through a process from a strategic level to a tactical level um, to really make you consider some of the things that you need internally as it relates to assortment and shelving so that you can become more strategic both for retailers and suppliers, so you can then collaborate in those areas of opportunity. So first of all, organizations need to have overall corporate strategies as they relate to assortment and shelving. Next, they need to have strategies associated with specific categories or business units. And then the analysis happens, the fun stuff, the stuff that we tend to jump into without those first two pieces. Um, but um, when you have those first two pieces, it makes it much easier to make those strategic decisions and choices because of the overarching corporate organizational strategies and processes that are in place. And then ultimately, the best shelving and assortment recommendations can be made. So consider these things when you're kind of thinking about how your organization does this um, for their assortment and shelving processes. First of all, you need processes internally behind assortment and shelving. And another really important note that I hear from clients all the time is, well, we have the software. That's our, our process. That is not a process. It's a software. You need to tie in with strategy. You need to have streamlined and aligned approaches to doing assortment regardless of what retail you're working on or for retailers regardless of what categories they're working on. So you have that strategic and aligned approach that to, to make sure that your target consumer and those pieces are really being pushed through all the way to um, developing the um, assortment recommendations. And finally, another really important note is that training on efficient, an efficient assortment or a shelving tool does not mean that you're trained on the fundamentals of those tactics, and it doesn't mean that you're trained on category management, especially when it relates to shelving and assortment. So many organizations and senior management say, well, we do you know, space training. We give that to our entire category management team, people know how to make planograms. That's not the same as shelf strategy. And, um, and the shelf strategy piece should be training that's incorporated to, into every part of your organization that impacts or makes decisions that relate to the shelf and product assortment. So some really big opportunities there. There's a lot of different ideas in there. Um, and this is really based on a lot of the discussion, like I said, that we've had with both suppliers and retailers and why they're having some of their struggling of, of, of their category management team ending up being so tactical. And this can have a lot to do with that. So I want to go through each of the steps in more detail. So I'm going to start out with step one, which is the corporate strategies. So when I go through these steps, I'm going to be breaking it out um, from a retailer perspective and a supplier perspective. My um, thoughts on this are is that retailers should understand the supplier perspective and suppliers should understand the retailer perspective. It's all part of this whole attempt to collaborate. So for retailers, they need to, you need to confirm your retailer strategy. Um, based on your format strategy, which directly affects assortment and shelving. So, for example, hypermarkets can carry up to 100,000 SKUs in their stores, while grocery stores can carry anywhere between 25 to 50,000, and hard discounts can carry as few as 1,000 SKUs. 
So obviously, format strategy significantly impacts shelf and assortment. You also need to do things like uh, verify the category roles and understand um, uh, how con consumer decision trees are going to play a role in how space is managed. Um, then, then you've got suppliers. And suppliers need to have best practices um, developed and a way to evaluate those best practices on an ongoing basis. They need best-in-class assortment and shelving development at a business unit level so that then there's these frameworks that then the category management teams can be using those frameworks when they're going and doing that work for their individual retailers. And it doesn't, it's not the same thing as templating and, and canning things, but what it does is it kind of sets them up so they don't have to do all of that extra work. And you have five teams doing exactly the same thing, but they're all doing them individually because they're each working on different business development teams. Um, then you need to integrate into the business unit plans um, those best-in-class approaches for assortment and, shel uh, assortment and shelving, and then you need, need to execute those best-in-class approaches and principles and processes into the retail sales organization. So really some important strategies in, in order for you to be able to kind of set up that framework to be able to have a more strategic approach to your assortment and shelving. So let's go through some examples. Um, for the retailer, for assortment and shelving strategies, they need to have well-articulated strategies. And it's kind of interesting. It's one of the areas that we end up working, um, consulting with a lot of retailers on, is trying to help them to articulate their overall strategies. So these strategies need to reflect what they're trying to accomplish corporately, not at a category level, but corporately in these tactics that consider the consumer that's shopping in their store format or banner. Um, and they need to have these overriding strategies, rules, and principles that really help to guide their category management teams when making specific category assortment decisions. Because otherwise, every, everyone is making decisions um, potentially differently, and so you're sending different mixed messages to the consumer as well. And they also need to share these strategies, rules, and principles with their supplier partners, and especially with the, if they have vendor partners or category captains or whatever they're called, um, so that they really do understand what the retailer is trying to accomplish, so they, they can also come in with better plans and ones that align to exactly what the retailer is trying to accomplish. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I mentioned about, um, I, and I want to give some examples here too. So I mentioned that many benefits of planogramming are intended to satisfy the shopper. So maximizing shopper friendliness relates to the consumer decision tree. And a full consumer decision tree maps out each of the decisions that a shopper makes when selecting a product. So for example, if we take the pet food category, we can see there's four main decisions that a shopper must make. And it's important to note that all, not all decisions are made consciously by the shopper and that all the decisions may take place in a split second. And it's therefore important that the shelf is set up to avoid shopper confusion and aid the decision-making process. And also that the analysis is done the same way so that you can look at your data in exactly the same way that the consumer um, is shopping the section. So um, if we take a look at the pet food example that I've got here, a shopper looking for pet food is first going to cho um, choose whether they're looking for dog or cat food. And there might be other animal foods as well, but we're just going to focus on dog and cat for simplicity. Then, assuming that they're shopping for dog food, the next decision is whether they're going to be looking for regular feed or treats. And then if they're choosing regular feed, then the next decision is on format. Are they looking for wet or dry food? And then, having chosen wet food, the brands available to decide from are like whatever the brands are um, within that specific uh, segment. So this is really how the um, shelf should be allocated as well. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you an example of how to allocate the shelf that way. The interesting thing is, is that I've, we work with a lot of um, suppliers. And in some supplier organizations, the marketing team has the consumer decision trees, and they don't share them because they're too proprietary, and they don't want them to be um, misused or abused. But the, the thing is, is that this is the kind of stuff that really adds incredible value to retailers. So huge opportunity to um, you know, really make sure that you're um, using those and maximizing the use of those consumer decision trees um, with retailers that you're uh, collaborating with. So that's from a retailer perspective. Um, 
um, that, that, that overall corporate strategy. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the supplier corporate strategy and that perspective. Um, in a lot of organizations, the Catman team is a tactical role that sits in at the end of a process that starts with product development, then it's handed off to marketing the new product, and then to sales to put a sales spin on the brilliant ideas and plans that have been developed. And then you've got the addition of the category analysis and planogramming um, by suppliers that's an added value to the retailer and really a standard practice in the consumer package goods industry. There's still a lot of organizations that kind of function this way with a process that kind of um, goes along this path. But a fact-based approach behind categories, from a, and, and the reason that it's been set up is that that fact-based approach behind category opportunities can really make a big difference in the results. And retailers are really demanding that as well. Um, and, then it, and also the supplier needs to be looking at things from a category opportunity, not just a brand-driven opportunity if they want to be talking category management to the retailer. But there's some fundamental problems with this process. Um, it, this approach never gets to any overarching strategies for the supplier. And that's why the role can end up being very tactical and less strategic, and something that focuses more on the retailer and their needs than on internal alignment and a more strategic approach to the category. So one of the opportunities um, to really improve this model is, oh, Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So in this approach, category management teams have a very tactical role, where sometimes they're required to fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, there's interesting goals and objectives set internally. A lot of the time, marketing ends up setting distribution targets based on internal volume requirements. And in a lot of cases, it's the strategy will be, we want 100% distribution in all retailers in the United States, or something like that, like some crazy distribution target that's absolutely um, not going to work and so then all of a sudden you know some of those volume objectives are not going to be met um, and then those distribution targets um, those are required to be achieved by the sales organization and um, then the category uh, management um, group is required to stuff in all of those initiatives into the assortment and into the um, into the planograms and trying to make the data look um, like there, there's a reason that they need to bring it in. So it's kind of putting it in, it in at the end instead of incorporating some of that strategy um, all throughout the, the, um, the plans, all the way from product development through to marketing and sales. And the other concern is, is that it's really um, not considering the target consumer. So the opportunity to, is to have an aligned approach across the teams and focus on the target shopper and focus on strategies and principles. So the opportunity is really to add in that category analysis and, and understanding um, across multi-functions within the supplier organization, from product development to marketing to sales. And so that category approach is considered. And then sales no longer has to rely on a relationship for selling only and lots of money to get new products listed. A fact-based valued ad approach can be invaluable to the retailer, and it creates a tailored approach for retailers based on their strategies. And it also allows suppliers to do a much better job in terms of planning and really having more realistic expectations in terms of new product launches. So suppliers who are able to adopt this can become much more strategic with their new product launches through a strong category and consumer understanding. And also, suppliers need to ensure that they're communicating with all functions at the retail who, who they're involved with. So I've already mentioned about multifunctional teams. It's not just the category manager who should be, who is affected by innovation and those kind of things. And that's why multifunctional teams are so critical um, in, in a more collaborative approach in business. So suppliers need to have formally developed strategies and shelf and assortment. Uh, integrated across their organization. So some suggestions, that's some best practices created um, with corporate guidelines and principles and how as an organization you do uh, assortment and shelving. And then developing those best in class category standards to create that frame framework for all of the work. Then you integrate it into categories. So for all of the key categories where you do category management work, then those best-in-class standards are integrated into category plans as well as new item processes. And that includes gold standard planograms and assortment. 
and then executing at retail, completing retail projects. So this is where we tend to jump in a lot right now, but completing the retail projects using those best-in-class standards, guidelines, and processes instead of individuals on all these retail teams having to kind of start from scratch all the time, a lot of that background work is done for them. So they can really jump in and get deep fast, but at a much more strategic level. And then also checking and adjusting internally that process um, to make sure that it's, it's staying robust, it's tying in with all of the key data sources, all of that kind of stuff. And so ultimately, what that's going to do is really give you um, that strategic internal shelving and assortment approach that's so critical um, for supplier organizations. So um, here are some questions that um, uh, I would like for you to consider. And I'm just going to run a polling question here just to kind of um, get some gauge kind of from the audience today. Um, first of all, how strategic and prepared your internal organization is for um, for um, product assortment we're going to start with. And then we'll do one um, separately for space management because sometimes these two tactics are treated very differently. So um, there's there may be a different um, uh, look with that. So what I'd like for you to do is uh, click on where you kind of rate your organization in terms of um, that, that overarching corporate strategic approach that's really helping you, either as a retailer or a supplier, to make um, that, that, that you really understand what your overarching strategies are for assortment. So I'll give a few more seconds here. I'd like for everyone to plug in with their response. OK, I'll give five more seconds, and then I'm going to close this poll. OK, so let's take a look at the results here. And this can be um, pretty surprising to organizations when they, when they go through and do this to realize that, wow, you know, there really is an opportunity for us to look. And, and some of this, it's not hard work to do. But it's really important because you want to have that aligned focus. So um, I have a really whacked out looking screen here right now. But hopefully you can see the results of this, um, this polling question. 14% um, have high um, st strategy at a corporate level on assortment, 64% on, um, with a medium strategic approach, and 21% on a limited. And there's quite a few people in this. So um, definitely some um, difference in terms of uh, the, the level of uh, strategic approach from a corporate perspective. So let's go to the second question, which, is, which relates to your strategic approach from a shelving perspective, and see if that differs at all. And, and be totally honest. Don't put this in as where you wish you were, but where you actually are in terms of your overall strategic approach to shelving. Okay, I'll give five more seconds for you guys who are indecisive on your answers. Okay, and I'll share those answers now. So it looks like um, from, a, from a shelving perspective, there may be less um, strategic uh, corporate processes and guidelines associated with 12%, 59% on medium, and then 20, 29% unlimited, so the limited um, goes up even more. And I'm going to go into more detail in terms of what that can look like and some of those um, more uh, strategic approaches. So that's going to be some of the stuff that I'll uh, share um, in some of the upcoming work that we're going to be doing here. So now that we kind of understand what we need from a corporate perspective, now let's go in and kind of take a look at some opportunities to understand um, the category and business unit strategies. So once again, um, let's take a look at things from a different perspective. We're going to look at toothbrushes. We're going to look first of all at Retailer X and their overall toothbrush strategy. So 
first of all, we're assuming that they have their overarching strategies in terms of assortment for their organization. So they may have an, a strategy that they're going to be highly developed in a premium segment um, with their private label brand um, being their main value brand within all key categories. Um, so those kind of objectives, they may have a market coverage objective, um, their private label, they have to have an overarching private label strategy. So now we can see what they're trying to accomplish within toothbrushes. And this is the kind of stuff that in a lot of cases, this information either is assumed, but it's not actually finalized or confirmed. Um, it's not shared with vendors uh, and vendor partners who are trying to do the work for them. So this really um, is, it, it would be more detailed than this, but this just shows some, kind of some of the, um, the things that they're thinking about within um, toothbrushes. So they're going to have a broad assortment with a limited assortment in value and a broad assortment in premium. So what that means is that when they go to do their analysis, a fair share index on space and um, number of items is not relevant because they want to have more, they want to have more premium SKUs. So they want to have high fair share indexes. So if there's a 20 share in toothbrushes of uh, a category share, they might allocate 30 or 40 percent of their assortment and or space to the premium segment because they want to be highly developed in it. Um, so really important to understand that. So then as a manufacturer, if you're going in, that you're not telling them that they need to cut back on their premium support because you understand that that's exactly what they're trying to accomplish and they're actually succeeding at it. Um, they might have a market coverage objective so that, that this is the percentage of SKUs that they carry that, um, that are represented in the market. So it might be very high um, on this important category for them of a 90. So they're going to carry SKUs that represent 90%. But they also have, uh, they may have some um, uh, perspective on variety versus duplication as well. Um, they have a private label strategy. Their private label competes with value segment in manual and in the battery segment. Uh, for toothbrushes, they have a large size strategy. They want to carry bundle packs and have large size offerings. They want to be the first mark to market and have quick decisions on new product launches, and they're treating the category role as routine. So that's kind of their overarching strategies that relate to category. Then we look at it from suppliers. Suppliers need to be equally uh, strategic in terms of what they need in their toothbrush category. So they may have things like maintaining a master item database that's segmented and in integrated with a shelf um, specific to the toothbrush category. They complete category health assessments from a top line perspective across retailers, competitive, and geographies, and continue to have an in-depth understanding of categories, trends, and tactics. And this information isn't something that just the category management team does and keeps it kind of to them. This should be shared broadly with marketing, anyone who um, really needs to understand toothbrushes, logistics, any part of that multifunctional team so that they can really understand that category. So when they're making strategic decisions and choices and when they're on that multifunctional team, they really understand the category. Um, they need to have best-in-class assortment guidelines customer segments, category roles, rationale across store formats, and having category layout and adjacency recommendations based on the consumers and the decisions that, that they make. There can also be best-in-class shelving guidelines, including channel, geography, and shopper segments, and even have planograms that include generic best-in-class for channels, geographies, or sh and shopper segments that really create the basis um, for some of the other work. Um, when it comes to planograms, there's so many organizations who are still not um, using or inputting data into their planograms, and it's such a shame um, because it ends up being that they're so focused on all of the tactical and they're creating thousands of planograms that the most important and valuable piece, which is that value, understanding some of the um, ways that you can measure shelf that are phenomenal um, measures, and I'll be showing those to you in a few minutes as well, um, and, and we're kind of um, skipping that piece because it's too much work and too much maintenance. And so trying to figure out how do you become, how do you kind of take some of that energy that's, create, that's kind of created um, across different teams and stuff and do it all in an aligned approach to the point and, that then it becomes customized for each retailer so that, that then you have the time to potentially add in the data. Um, so this is only an example, but it's something that we've worked with several clients and the results are quite compelling. Um, there's a realization 
that there are significant strategic gaps within many supplier organizations. And without this information and the guidelines and processes, category management is, is going to continue to be a tactical role in the company. And it really is difficult to move to a more collaborative approach with retailers without this um, overarching strategy. So now that we have a strong understanding of the retailer and supplier's overall strategies and toothbrushes, um, and that this strategy puts together some of the guidelines and principles on the direction of the assortment and shelving project. And it's why different retailers require different assortment recommendations and why suppliers can't do a one-size-fits-all or a retailer-by-retailer -retailer tactical approach to assortment and shelving. So the two kind of have to be done together. So um, I'm going to go back to some polling questions. And so um, we talked about how strategic your organization is at a corporate level. Now let's see if there's a difference in how strategic your organization is um, in assortment at a category level. So I showed you the example for um, toothbrushes. So now I want to ask you how strategic you are internally across your key categories as it relates to assortment and see if there's a difference there. And I always find this very interesting because a lot of the time, and my expectation here is that we're going to see that there's a much higher strategic approach um, at a category level than there is at a corporate level. Okay, I'll give five more seconds here. Okay, so let's take a look at these answers. Um, the numbers are higher, not as, not as much higher as I thought they would be. 33% um, that they're high um, with their strategic guidelines, best-in-class examples, consumer focus. 53% are medium, and 13% are low. And that's on the assortment side of things. Um, so let's take a look and see um, how that differs from the shelving side. So same question, how strategic are you on the shelving side when it comes to um, at a category level? And this one is really interesting. See, I get to see the numbers creeping up and down as you guys are making your selections. It's pretty cool. I get really excited about this stuff. OK, five more seconds here to plug in your answers. OK, so let's take a look at the results here. So uh, once again, much lower on, um, on uh, shelving than on assortment, which is kind of interesting, kind of scary, actually, because um, if you're highly strategic in your assortment, but you're not bringing it in, this strategy into your space and, and into the planogramming, then uh, you know, there, there might be a lot of great um, strategy happening in the assortment that's not happening in shelf, and shelf is obviously where things are being executed as well. So um, interesting perspective there as well. So one of the things that you might want to do is kind of try to capture um, on your own time some of the areas of opportunity that you see and start kind of working, if, you, if you're um, a manager of a category management team, kind of start trying to develop some ideas and plans of ways that you might be able to start to influence these things um, and or find somebody in, the, uh, in your organization that can help you to um, champion that um, higher up because it obviously has to um, have some association um, with, from a senior management perspective as well. So the next step uh, that we're going to walk through is the fun stuff, the assortment and shelving analysis, which is probably the area that um, we all feel most, most comfortable with. And that's um, doing specific assortment analysis and then also shelving analysis. And I'm going to break this into two different pieces um, because they are um, different in terms of the analytics associated with them. So the um, assortment analysis uh, step results in um, 
typically in suggested product lineup. It can be based on market coverage. It can be based on variety versus duplication. It should tie in with those overarching strategies, um, particularly for the retailer perspective if you're completing retailer product assortments, and also product listing and delisting validation. Um, when you do assortment analysis, um, a lot of organizations have the push of a button um, approach to assortment, which is critical. I have absolutely nothing, no problem with that. But one of the components that um, should be considered is that um, I always tell people before you start doing any kind of deep dive analysis, take an hour before you do it and do a category assessment, review what's going on in the category, who's growing and declining, are baseline sales up or down, what's driving those baseline sales, is it, is it um, you know, uh, is it assortment and new items, or is it uh, uh, promotion, or is it display, or pricing, or what are, what's, what are the dynamics of the category? Also looking and understanding the trends and those kind of things, because that kind of information can really help you. And then if, if you start looking at category and segment productivity first, and understanding what's the share per SKU, the share of items, fair share index, those kind of things from the segment and brand perspective. And also trying to tie that in to say, okay, I know that the retailer wants to be most or least developed in these areas. Then you can really go in and do effective item analysis very easily um, because you've already seen where the biggest er areas of, of gap and opportunity are. So really a, a great way to do, to do an approach assortment that might not be completely available within your assortment tool. But you need to start with that top line category understanding. And that's regardless of what tactic you're going into and, and doing those deep dives on. Look at the overall ca all category first. It, it's a great way to start and can give you perspective that otherwise you may not realize. Same thing for shelving. If you're doing shelving projects, doing the category assessment, reviewing, reflecting on the overall strategies, um, and then um, you can do all kinds of category and segment productivity analysis, the share of shelf, profit per square foot, sales per square foot, and so on. So there's a lot of different um, calculations associated with it. And um, these are also some of the areas that anyone in your organization who is making requests for shelving changes or to add new products in, regardless of your retailer supplier, they should understand how basic shelf um, management works and um, you know how different components of um, the shelf work. So, for example, a lot of a lot of people don't understand what linear feet actually means, and so you know it's the sum of the width of the front positions along the shelf. So, the linear feet in this example is 20 feet um, in this shelf. And it's 20 feet on each shelf. So the actual total linear feet of this category is 80 linear feet. And then we've got cubic feet, which equals the total space occupied by the height times the width times the depth. So in this example, height varies by shelf merchandise space. Some shelves are 12 inches high. Some are 30 inches high. And then this is multiplied by that 20 feet, which is the total width of the shelves, times the shelf depth. And once again, this may vary because the bottom shelf may have deeper shelves. So the calculation for cubic feet can be more complex than linear feet. So let's see what the difference is from an analytic standpoint if you're doing linear feet versus cubic feet. The pie chart below the planogram is a sample graph that's generated by the planogram software. So the left pie chart shows that each of the shelves has 25% of the linear space, and the cubic allocation is completely different, showing more than 60% of the cubic space allocated to shelf one, which is the bottom shelf. So as we learned from looking at cubic space, the discrepancy is in shelf one, where there, which is both deeper and has a taller merchandise space. So if you have um, you know, your, your um, merchandising team internally and a supplier who's saying, well, let's move it down to the bottom shelf and this and that. And if they're not considering these kind of things, then they don't understand why the planograms don't get approved or executed um, when they're sold, sold in to the retailer, when they go in and, and present these to the retailer. Most companies only look at linear space, but some categories that have large products or large merchandising spaces should be considered with both linear and cubic space.
So that's just an example um, for the space piece. Um, I have to carry on. I get so excited that I, I, uh, I don't want to go over time on my uh, the webinar today. So then step four is basically making the um, assortment and shelving recommendations. So you've done all that awesome analysis now. And now based on the assessment, you want to back up the documentation and rationale for recommendations. So ultimately, what the overall objectives should be are to increase sales, increase turns, reduce out of stocks, reduce inventory, increase profit, and increase shoppability shopability. Um, so these are some of the um, uh, things that should be results from the recommendations. And there are also things that should be tracked um, once the plans are executed. So I've already explained the overall re assortment and shelving strategies drive the rest of the approach. Um, so now that we've established what efficient assortment and shelving are, and that the strategy drives the rest of the process. I want to talk a little bit about science and art and how they're both required in the process because um, science is really where the analytics come into play in the process and that's all of the analytics, the software, all of those kind of things. But then you've got the art um, for assortment and shelving and the art piece is a little bit different and um, is the part that a lot of um, uh, different components are required. Um, for the more artistic touch, it's driven by experience and deep strategy understanding. Um, it talks about variety versus duplication, incrementally, it, incrementality and cannibalization, innovation, and consumer and shopper. And there's different ways to approach um, that art component, but it is a piece that goes beyond, and that's where that whole overarching strategy piece, that corporate strategy piece, especially for suppliers, can really play a role in here. Because if you have fantastic information on incrementality and cannibalization that you can be incorporating into um, the assortment and uh, shelving pieces, then how do you tie that in in a simplistic way? Because it also can't be something really complicated or hard to understand, or once again, it's not going to be it's not going to be well, easy to roll out or explain to retailers. So hopefully by going through this, um, you'll agree with my conclusion that many organizations need to be more strategic in their shelving and assortment approach, both from a retailer and a supplier perspective. So I've put together some basics, um, things that are examples of things that multifunctional teams really need to understand about assortment and shelving. So first of all, optimizing the product mix and shelf space in any category category in the store is critical to driving volume and profit, both for retailers and suppliers. Both efficient assortment and shelving can require a large time and resource investment for both retailers and manufacturers. So based on this, um, many organizations have invested in sophisticated assortment and space tools to reduce the time and resource investment. The incredible automation that can be done through these software applications really allows for decisions to be made within days instead of weeks or months. But the problem is that there's almost a, um, such a reliance on the software and the tools um, that, it, that it gets confused with capability and processes. So I mentioned it before, in many organizations their process is the software, which is why it ends up being tactical and sometimes even administrative tasks associated with some really incredibly important tactics. So, and like I mentioned before, they may even think that the training on the software means that they're getting training in category management. So what are some of the other things they need to know? They need to understand that the variety of assortment is an important consumer and shopper factor when consumers are shopping at the store that they go to. A greater variety and a larger assortment increases the probability of finding what they really want. Also, variety gives shoppers the alternatives when they shop rather than having to purchase the same thing each shopping trip. However, too many choices can lead to confusion and complications for the shopper, and it can also lead to huge expenses for the retailer because as they bring in more and more items, they have lower turns and more inventory um, wrapped up on the shelf. So skew rationalization and understanding how it affects consumers and their choices is really critical um, when you're talking about product assortment. It's also under, important to understand the impact of assortment and shelving changes on retail operations. Um, 
with changes in assortment and shelving, there's increased costs in logistics, inventory, advertising, planning, shelf space, and sales. All things that need to be considered um, and respected uh, when suppliers are going out and launching um, new things with retailers on a regular basis. If you can show how you're reducing costs in your approaches and start talking and focusing more on things that the retailer is trying to um, uh, attain, um, and that's kind of some of the stuff that happens with collaboration and, and in the sharing. If a retailer is trying to reduce their cost of goods sold through increased tunes, turns, and reduced inventory, then those kind of things need to be um, showing up in the assortment and space recommendations that are made. Adding new items to the assortment or reducing items to the assortment is an ongoing process for retailers, and it fits within the category management framework. To be effective for a manufacturer or retailer, an assortment process needs to meet some key criteria. So you have to have that internal process. It has to be treated as an ongoing process, not as a one-time project. The process needs to be consistent across business units, categories within your organization. It drives efficiencies and really enables people to build expertise in the process. A consistency across time is also beneficial. So frequency of assortment to be done, um, all those kind of things. Every category can have a different frequency, but there needs to be a plan. The process needs to be simple and straightforward. The more complex the processes, the more room there is for mistakes or delays. It can get caught up in all kinds of bureaucracy and red tape if it's too complex. And at the same time, the data and tools need to be robust to ensure mo the most accurate, insightful, and actionable recommendations. Now let's talk about a little bit about some of the shelving things to teach your organization. In terms of basic of planograms, planograms are more than just a graphic image or diagram that includes fixtures and products that are specific to a category. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations continue to treat them as just that. But you can turn planograms into a graphic image into an analytic engine that populates sales and movement data, which enables the user to calculate empowering information associated with movement on the shelf. And they can also become marketing tools using the usage of graphics and signage and, and adding in displays into planograms. So a planogram can be everything from a pretty picture to a highly powerful analysis tool. And I won't harp on about that you really should be thinking about the, those analytics and stop focusing so much on the pretty pictures. So with the correct inputs, planograms can help retailers and suppliers to become more strategic on the shelf. Um, first of all, the retailer's shelf strategies need to be understood. Different retailer strategies can directly affect shelf layout and overall targets and objectives for planogram. Next, the retailer's fixture dimensions, including section sizes, gondola measurements, and shelf measures need to be input. And these can vary significantly across retail stores within a chain. And in some chains, if they're older ones or independents, then you've even got a bigger mess on your hands because they're all different. And then lastly, product information needs to be included. There's much detail required at a product level to maximize the use of the planogram software. The most important thing to hear, here to note is that the addition of data and segmentation at an item level turns that planogram from a pretty picture into an analytics tool. So let's look at an example of the, the product data requirements in the planogram. Here's what you need in terms of product information, but the additional product data requirements in, include the average unit sold per week per store, the cost per case, and the average unit price, and the units per case should also be available in the product data. Then, once this data is made available, the, the analytic possibilities are really fantastic. There's literally hundreds of automatic calculations available within the more sophisticated software programs once those few data points are input. Some organizations opt not to input those few measures because of the extra time that it takes. But look at these incredible, delicious measures that come out of software that has the right inputs put into it. A lot of the things that are so important for retailers and suppliers internally to understand um, really how, for suppliers, how they play on the shelf and how they compare to their, um, to their competition in terms of some of these really strategic pieces that then you can start talking to retailers about. Um, but without those inputs of data, you never get to this point. 
also by segmenting the item data, I already talked about it a little bit about the consumer decision tree. All of the assortment analysis can be done to see how the consumer sees the category, and then the planograms can be developed based on the most important consumer segments. So we already went through the decision tree in dog food, but then what we can do is we can use these consumer decisions to strategically set up the shelf based on how the consumer thinks about and shops the category. So the consumer decision tree is pivotal in creating strategic planograms. So really, you have to think about, are we using our consumer decision trees in our um, assortment and our planograms? Like I said before, many marketing teams have invested in consumer decision trees, but they don't, don't even share them internally, never mind with their retail partners. And huge, huge opportunity here. And everybody should understand those consumer decision trees. So it would help sales and marketing understand the implications of innovation on product assortment and the shelf for the retailer. Um, I remember when I was at the P&G and we launched a compact laundry detergent and one of the biggest selling stories was the impact on the shelf by moving to a more condensed product. And we had, we had the data input for every single huge, large retailer and we're able to show the impact on turns, inventory, out of stock, everything. Um, it was a fantastic experience. But I remember another time when we launched a product that didn't consider the shelf at all and it was actually too tall by about half an inch to fit on most retailers' bottom shelves. And so um, for that reason alone, a lot of retailers couldn't carry it because they weren't willing to go and reline every store for a relatively insignificant product launch. It also helped to understand internal brand results versus competition and across segments. Um, what are the biggest strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats on the shelf that need to be understood and perhaps remedied? So hopefully you realize strategic assortment and shelf management isn't just for the people who are doing the, that more tactical work within supplier organizations. Anyone involved in developing or selling in innovation or business plans need to be educated about assortment and the shelf. Doesn't need, they mean they need training on the software, but in the principles, best practices, and some basic analytics. Will help move your organization forward significantly. Then we have retailers. Retailers also need to be educated about assortment in the shelf, and they need strategies, guidelines, and processes in place that allow folks within their organization to make aligned decisions on these tactics as well. By developing data-rich planograms, including key measures that are important to the retailer, decisions that will affect the shelf will be made more strategically, and implementation at store level is going to be more successful. So assortment and space management need to go beyond the scope of category management and space management teams so that different functions within the retailer really understand the implication of category decisions on assortment and on the shelf. So I'm coming back to our joint business planning framework that I started at the beginning of the webinar and um, really um, as a reminder that the, the first key thing is to have those corporate strategies and goals identified and specifically for what we've talked about today, what are the overall assortment and space strategies for you as a retail organization or the manufacturing organization, then getting into category strategies and then doing the analytics. Much more effective way and that's how you're going to help to get to a more collaborative approach. So I hope you found that uh, helpful, um, kind of a different spin on uh, webinars that I do, but I like to um, bring in things that are current and things that um, you know we were talking about at the conference last week, so hopefully you, you found it interesting. Um, I am going to be um, walking through now a little bit more about Category Management Knowledge Group and, and just in a few slides if you want to stick around for a few minutes to get to know us a little bit better. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we're a category management training company. We have an online uh, training approach. Um, it's all accredited training, but that's not where we um, stop. We tie in with custom client schedules and live webinars to increase engagement and retention. We add in case studies to enhance the learning experience. For a lot of our uh, clients, we also run live sessions, um, which provide an opportunity to further discuss and practice new skills. And we also have an ongoing support team. So regardless of if you're an individual who wants to take training or you're a large organization, our ongoing support, our support team is um, bar none one of the best around. 
and really does um, allow every student um, to successfully complete their training um, as much as we can help them out. Um, and we have a very, very big fan base of students who continue to come back for more and more training with us and clients. We have a lot of very long-term clients. So we really realized that um, our approach to training was actually very similar to our approach to uh, the category management model. So we want to work with um, our with potential, uh, I guess, prospects to create a custom solution to meet your needs. So we start with a discovery and consultation to really understand your objectives, short term and long term. Then we work with you to develop the right training plan, whether it's for you or your team or an organization, and we co-develop that with you based on your specific needs. Then we execute it throughout your organization, and then we meet quarterly with you to review the results and tweak the plan to stay on track, assuming that you're the one that's going to own the training long term. So we don't just sell you something and leave. We're with you all the way through the process. Um, we have three different types of programs. You can have team programs, so you can have a common program across teams. We have individual programs, and we have all course programs where you can have access to all of the courses. And for organizations that have over um, 50 people, this is the most cost-effective way, um, and it does give you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can set up courses and programs uh, and curriculums for your organization. So regardless of which way you choose, um, it's all industry certified. Um, we have great access to some other components that I'll walk you through um, in a little bit more detail in some of these other slides. These are our sets of courses. So we have certified courses and non-certified courses. Our courses are all certified by the Category Management Association. Um, at, and so if you take all of the certified courses, you would qualify for all three levels of accreditation with the CMA. And then we have non-certified courses that we are continuing to develop as well. Um, everything from um, in-store marketing to retail. We're working a lot on the convenience channel right now um, and also on our trade promotion and trade management. So you can either pick us and pick six courses that you want to take and just take those. Or you can team, can everyone can take different ones. It really depends on um, how you want to approach it. We also have um, custom all these different types of programs that I explained before. We have our foundational, intermediate, and advanced programs. And if you're interested in certification, those match up with certification requirements. Um, and you, like I said before, you can build your own programs. Something else that we have that's new is our day in the life of the category manager program um, that we have just uh, rolled out with a client and it was received so positively that we're expanding that and offering it as a, a live half day session um, for, uh, it's perfect for key account management teams, uh, marketing teams, anyone who really needs to better understand retail. Uh, will benefit from this half-day session. And uh, it would be me that would be coming out to facilitate it. It's a really awesome half-day. It's a very fun program and all, full of insight uh, for organizations who really are trying to better understand their retailers. We also have these other options that I mentioned before. Um, when, it, when we talk about resources, um, every student, if you buy a course, if you buy a program, um, it's all available um, through our online training center. Within our online training center, we also um, have a lot of resources. So we also, in addition to that, whatever training you buy, um, every year we run six case study live webinars, and these are for our students only, and they're based on they're educational based and they're hands on. And uh, we and sometimes we invite solution providers to come in and present their educational IP, and other times we run the sessions ourselves. It depends on what our students are requesting. Um, we also go into the online center for your courses and testing. You get updated student transcripts and certificates. You also get corporate reports. We have a resource library that has over 750 white papers, books, videos, and documents. It's all searchable, so you can find things um, really easily. Our students love our resource library. We also post daily news. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we also have a glossary. It says 300 terms here. We haven't updated. This is, actually has over 600 terms now. And we have one that's available on a PC, and we have another one that is completely available on mobile. So fantastic, um, it, it's dynamic, so you can click on things, there's links, there's suggestions for other things to review in the, in the glossary that are related terms, those kind of things. So our students love the glossary. 
Um, and I had already, already talked about ongoing support. We have our um, support team that's all accredited category management professionals, including our administrators. Um, we have a live chat, so when you're taking your training, you can click on the online live chat. Um, we're open 12 hours a day and get somebody live to help you walk you through if it's just a simple, I forgot my password, or a, I really don't understand this concept, can you help me? Um, we're there to help you as you're going along. So we have, um, for our corporate clients, we have Checkpoint student webinars and also a manager program so that managers can stay in tune in terms of what um, their students, what their um, employees are doing and so they can kind of help support them along the way. And then we have these additional cost programs with live training, study guides, case studies, mentor programs and any kind of custom development. We're actually working with a few clients now who are, who are basically leasing space from us in our learning management system. And so if you um, are looking for, if you don't have a learning management system, and, but you would like to have a central place for all of your category management materials and be able to communicate to your team specifically, we can give you a private site and it's actually very economical. So that's something else that we can do as well. So um, that is it for um, the webinar for today. So in terms of next steps, um, if you are interested in checking out our online training resource center and seeing what it's all about, then you can request a trial membership. You can go into your materials section and you'll see one. Um, I think it's about three quarters of the way down the materials list that's requesting the trial membership. And you can get two weeks access to it so you can see for yourself what it looks like. Um, then we also, you can request a no pressure orientation meeting. So you can just send an email to info at simkg.org and we can set up a meeting with you and have a discussion to see what your needs are and see if we can uh, help um, meet those needs for you. You can join us in LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Um, we're very active in social media. We have a fantastic LinkedIn category management learning forum um, that we would love for you to join. You can also follow our category management knowledge group in LinkedIn as well. And you can also register for our newsletter. So once again, all those links are in the materials section. And really, the opportunity is to help to build organizational capability um, and move to a more collaborative approach. And uh, because that is such a big focus for many organizations now, um, it's a really important one for us. And we would love to talk um, to you about how we can help you to do that. So um, if there's any questions, please type them into your chat box right now. And we'll stay on the line for a few minutes. I thank you all very much for um, participating in today's session. Um, and I'm just going to read some of the questions here and see if I can address them. Okay, I have a question. Um, when doing a basic assortment analysis uh, and I'm looking at an item rank by segment, for example, what's more important to look at, dollars or unit rank or sales per point of distribution rank? I'm aware that perhaps this depends on the strategic objective, but want your thoughts on this. That is a good question. Um, usually the unit rank, I would not look at units because units really relate to the shelf. Um, so units are a really important component of um, when, you're, when you're looking on the shelf because it's the units that are selling off the shelf, it's not the dollars. And so in order to make sure that you're not going to run out of stock, you have to obviously look at the unit sales. Um, dollar sales are typically the best way to look at a rank report. But then you also have to integrate in that piece on sales per point of distribution. I would not do an item rank on just on sales per point of distribution rank because there's some issues with that sales per point of distribution as well. Um, and so I would really strongly suggest that you look at dollars, but you also have the sales per point of distribution um, beside it, um, where what the opportunity dollars are or something like that. Um, to look at, but if I was only going to pick one measure, I would be doing dollars. So let me know if you guys have any other questions. There haven't been a lot of questions today. It's probably because I didn't shut up the whole uh, webinar, but uh, hopefully you got some value out of it.